Good evening. It is very, very good that these questions have come up tonight because they are valuable beyond price. Unless these things are properly understood, more especially things like come up in these questions, it is impossible to be able to clarify our thought enough to know how to work. Question number one is praying for your enemies. As we of the infinite way know that we must not pray for anything material, because we already have all, and know also that the same applies to every other human being, in what exact way must we pray for them? Now there's one mistake in here. And know also that the same applies to every other human being. That is not so. There is no spiritual truth about a human being. A human being has no spiritual qualities. A human being is not a child of God. A human being can never become a child of God. A human being, we are told by Paul, is a creature who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be and cannot please God. Now, a human being is a person who is born and who has been brought up under a belief in two powers, a person who lives to the personal sense of self, I, me, mine, a person who is a branch that is cut off from the tree, is not living and moving and having their being in God or in God-reliance, but is rather living from the standpoint of my wisdom, my health, my wealth, my integrity, my home, my family, my nation. These people, no matter how good they may ever become humanly, they may obey all Ten Commandments, but they can never get into heaven. They would be like St. John the Baptist, a good, 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 perfect man, but one who could never get into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, the least spiritual person could get into heaven before John the Baptist, according to Jesus Christ. As long as we are human beings, we have no qualities of God, we have no protection from God, we have no healing from God, we have no good from God, we have no supply from God, and if you want proof of it, look at your life and count up the days, weeks, or months in which you have been sick or had accidents or operations or unemployment or lack and limitation, or sin, or look at your families and tell me if you honestly believe that they are being God-governed, if they have been living without sin, without fear, without disease, without lack. You can't call that God-government. When we are God-government, we are held in the image and likeness of God, receive God's grace, and are maintained spiritually, without taking thought, without any possibility of sinning, and free even of accidents and diseases in proportion to our ability to remain in that high consciousness. Now, what is the object of the teaching of Jesus Christ? Christ. On this point, you will either succeed in understanding 
the infinite way or you will fail. What do you think was the purpose of Jesus Christ's religious teaching? Now remember, he was a Hebrew rabbi ordained in the Hebrew synagogue, teaching and preaching in the Hebrew synagogue. Now, why did he break away? Why did he refuse the teachings of the church after having been an ordained rabbi? What was there in his teaching that differed from the Hebrew teaching that made him go out and preach the gospel by the side of the sea and in the mountains, wherever he could find a gathering of people to listen to him? Why did he walk up and down the holy lands giving the people a new teaching? And what is that new teaching? Now this you have to discover. Otherwise you do not realize the nature of the Christ teaching. And in the end you will discover this. You must die daily. You must be reborn of the Spirit. Why must you be? Weren't you good enough as you were? No, or the Master would not have set up the major part of his teaching to show you that you must be born again. Your former birth is not right. Your former life is not right. You must be born again. Does not Paul make it clear to you that you are not children of God unless the Spirit of God dwell in you? And if the Spirit of God dwelled in you before, there would have been no need for the Jesus Christ ministry or for the Pauline ministry. If you were already perfect as you were before, if you were already under the law of God, what did we need a new religion for? What did we need a new teacher for? What did we need a new savior for? Well, only for one reason we needed all this and still do. And the reason is that as human beings you are a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. And before you can become children of God, you must die to your old self and you must be reborn again. It doesn't mean you have to die and be buried or cremated. Not that kind of a death. It means you must die to the personal sense of self in which you now realize God constitutes my selfhood. God is my life. God is my supply. God is my wisdom. God is my integrity. And you finally have to come to acknowledge, as Jesus did, I of my own self can do nothing. I of my own self am nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. But if I acknowledge that the Father within me doeth the works, if I acknowledge that the Father within me is the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water, if I acknowledge that the Father within me is my intelligence, my wisdom, my love, my integrity, if I deny that I am good, even if I am Jesus Christ, I must deny that I am good. Why callest thou me good, says Jesus Christ? Why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. When you so deny yourself, You are dying to yourself and you are being reborn of the Spirit. 
You are now accepting the teaching of Jesus Christ. No wonder I was a branch of a tree that was cut off. I thought I was good. I thought I was honest. I thought I was moral. I thought I was bright or smart or wise. Father, forgive me. Thou art the wisdom of my being, the life of my being. Whatever goodness is shown forth through me is not my goodness, but thy goodness. My wisdom isn't enough to take care of me. Thy grace is my sufficiency. Thy grace is my sufficiency. And so you are dying daily. And then you are reborn. This time of the spirit. And this time with the realization that the spirit of God indwells me and the spirit of God feeds me, clothes me, houses me. The spirit of God goes before me to make the crooked places straight. The spirit of God is my savior. The spirit of God is my intelligence. The spirit of God is the love that pours out through me. I of my own self am nothing, but the spirit of God in me is all. And now the Christ is born in you and you are the child of God. But before this can happen, remember, you must begin praying for your enemies. You must begin to pray for your enemies. And we come to this question now, how do we pray for our enemies? Well, now, first we have to acknowledge that as humans, we have all had to be awakened to the spiritual nature of our being, to our Christhood. As human beings, we were dead. We were dead in humanness. Awake thou that sleepest, awake thou that sleepest. That's the human race. Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give thee light. And so we must acknowledge, first of all, that as a human being, I was dead to Christ. As a human being, I was a branch that is cut off. And only by virtue of being touched by the Christ, only by the spirit indwelling, do I become alive in Christ, in God? When I can acknowledge that about me, I know how to pray. Because now I pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, open their eyes that they may see. Open their ears that they may hear. Open their consciousness that they may receive thee. Now, it is true. In our spiritual identity, we are divine. We are the child of God. But then, so is everybody else on the face of the globe. I'm sure that all of you have read in your own newspapers today, yesterday, here in Adelaide, the report from your health and welfare department about the condition of morals and Southern Australia, I'm sure you were properly shocked by it. Anyone would be at that coming out any place at all. And when you see this, do you not see an opportunity for prayer? Do you not see an opportunity to say, in some degree, we must have been like them at one time? Some may have been entirely that way and more so, and some not quite so, but to some extent all of us were lax in the high standards that we must hold in Christ. And so if we would like under those conditions that someone think enough of us to pray, Father, forgive them and open their eyes, is there not a call then on the part of everyone who read that to say, Father, let us not throw stones at them. Let us forgive them. Let us not judge, criticize, or condemn them. 
because perhaps, but for the love of God, but for the grace of God, there goes I. So let us not throw stones. Let us look at that report with proper shock that such conditions should be, but without criticism, without judgment, knowing that only in their ignorance could those people be that way. Only in their ignorance of their true identity. Only in their ignorance of the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in them and no one told them so. From childhood up, no one has told them that they are one with God and heir to God, joint heir to all the heavenly riches, and that the Father is eternally saying to them, Son, daughter, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. You don't have to cheat, lie, steal, defraud, commit adultery. You don't have to. All that I have is thine. Well, have you brought up your children that way? Have you, from their earliest years, drilled into them their spiritual identity and that they do not need man whose breath is in his nostril, they do not have to worship princes, they do not have to fear evil powers? If you haven't, you can understand well why we have among us some who are juvenile delinquents. Why not? They have not been brought up to their spiritual heritage, and neither were these people. And therefore, there is no sin in them. They're not sinning. They are ignorant. They are doing that which comes natural to them in their ignorance. Many have been professional gamblers. Many have done horribly wrong things in life, only to awaken later to their spiritual heritage. And sometimes, even though they may not have known how it happened, somebody was praying. And that prayer touched them. And so, these people of whom you read in this report are enemies of society. That makes them enemies of yours and of your children and of your grandchildren. But you dare not condemn them for it. You must pray for them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Open their eyes that they may see. In their spiritual identity, they are as much Christ as we are. The woman who was taken in adultery and forgiven by the Master, became one of his most ardent followers. How do we know which of these men and women we read about in this report will end up being a spiritual healer, a minister, practitioner, teacher? Who is to say that they won't? We had an experience on this line many years ago when, in my absence from the office and a woman taking charge, a woman called up and said, is there any hope that I can have spiritual help? I'm really sick unto dying. Oh, this lady in my office said, of course we'll help you right away. And the other lady said, but you don't understand, I'm a prostitute. And this lady in my office said, I can't hear a word you're saying. There's something wrong with the telephone. So just let me tell you that you are under God's care right now and call me tomorrow when my telephone line is more receptive. That girl went on to be healed. That girl went on to become a student. Who knows? which gambler there is today, which prostitute, which woman who for one reason or another, or man is committing adultery, who is to say what spiritual light they will be tomorrow. That is why in our work we never ask anybody about their past. Their past is dead. All we're interested in is 
What is the life that you are living today? Is your past life dead? Have you been reborn? Is the Christ with you? And so it is. We are not fulfilling our function of loving our neighbor as ourself unless we can look out upon this world of sinners and realize, first of all, as human beings, we are of that same weak flesh. And perhaps, but for the grace of God, there goes I. And not sit in self-righteousness, but in gratitude that the Spirit of God has awakened in us and changed our lives. And then be sure that we look out at this world without judgment, criticism, condemnation, but with eternal forgiveness unto seventy times seven, and pray that they too be reborn. And that is how to pray for our enemies. You often say that God is too pure to look on iniquity. Well, that is really the same question, because it really means this, that in spiritual truth, We have no sin in us, and neither has any one of these people that you read about in that report. There isn't a sinner among them in their true identity. It is only the life they are leading in their humanhood where they have erred, and we have erred, in one way or another, in one degree or another, every one of us in our humanhood has erred. If it was nothing more than just being angry with somebody, we were forsaking our spiritual basis. Now, <clears throat> unless we first recognize that in our humanhood we are a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth, we will have no way of knowing the next step. And you see, the ministry of Jesus Christ is a revelation that he acknowledged that we were branches of a tree that is cut off and he came to bring us back and attach us once more to the vine. That was the secret of his ministry. He wasn't talking to spiritual children of God. He was talking to mortals whom he wanted to bring back to the realization of their true identity and to conscious oneness with their source. He didn't think the money changers in the temple were spiritual when he whipped them out. He didn't think people were spiritual when he said to them, O ye vipers! Oh no, he recognized the mortal human status of mortals, and then said, you must be born again. And in recognition of this, he gave us the greatest document that has ever appeared in the literature of the world, the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, he recognized our humanhood, our ignorance, our evil, our erroneous way of living, because he said, ye have heard it said of old, and you are living under the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth of avenging yourselves on those who harm you. You are guilty of all these offenses of ye have heard it said of old. But I say unto you, and now he tells you how you've got to change. No more an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but resist not evil. No more do evil to those who do evil to you, but from now on, 
Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who do evil to you. Pray for those who are your enemies. He recognized our erroneous human status. But his mission was to teach us how to leave that and become the new man. That man who has his being in Christ. In the Sermon on the Mount, he tells you what you've got to do in order to give up your human status and become the child of God. Next year, you will have the opportunity of reading the revelation that was given to me on the Sermon on the Mount, for it will be in my new book. And you will see how it is that he recognized that we in our humanhood are impure, live erroneously, ignorantly. He didn't malign us for it. He didn't sentence us to hell for it. He told us we must change. You, my disciples, you must live this way. And he taught us in the Sermon on the Mount how we must live in order that we may become children of God and die to our old selfhood. Did he not say, I have come to heal the sick, to raise the dead? That was a recognition of our human status. He knew that in the eyes of God, we need no healing. We are spiritually pure, physically, mentally, morally, and financially. We are that in our spiritual image, but we are not that spiritual image until we die to the things that he told us about in ye have heard it said of old. We must die to that. We must be reborn into the person that we are to become. The spiritual image and likeness of God, which spiritually we are, but humanly we are not demonstrating. So it is then that it is, I know, a habit, a practice among some metaphysicians to deny their human status, to take the absolute stand, I am perfect, I am spiritual. It isn't consistent to make such declarations and then uh, live in the old way of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth or judging, criticizing, condemning. It isn't consistent. And so it is that even though we acknowledge with every fiber of our being that I in the midst of me is God, I in the midst of me is the offspring of God, I in the midst of me is my Christhood, my divinity. Nevertheless, well do I know that if I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. If I were to claim for Joel all that spiritual Christhood and perfection, how would I look myself in the face if I made a mistake or lost my temper or had an illness? How could I look myself in the face and say, that's Christ? No. Christ is my true identity. And like Paul, I will say to you, forgetting those things which are past, I'm looking forward into the future, trying each day to more nearly approach the perfection of my divinity. I claim not to have attained my Christhood, only to have attained some measure of it and trying hard to forget all of the human errors of my past, I'm looking forward and upward into a fuller and more complete realization of my Christhood, which when I attain will contain no more element of human error, human frailty, human weakness,
in praying for forgiveness for sins of yourself or others or just forgiving others, if you have said that illness and error are the results of universal beliefs and that the person concerned is not responsible for either, and that's correct. Does that mean then that you pray that ignorance be wiped out? That's exactly it. That is exactly it. Whether in myself or in you, or in these people whom we read about in the report, or the dictators of China, or the dictators of Russia, always, or any dictators that we may ever find in our midst, the prayer should be, Father, forgive them. They're not wicked, they're ignorant. They're not sinners. They're just mortal selves who believe uh, that they themselves must do something or they won't survive. Forgive them their ignorance and open their eyes that they may see and open their ears that they may hear. Awaken them. Oh, awake, awake, awake. And Christ will give thee light. Awake, awake. And so we in our prayers for forgiveness can say, awake, awake. Let Christ give thee light. Father, forgive them. Do not hold them in punishment, not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You'll see how far you are from Christhood when you begin to pray for your enemies. Another illustration and point from today's newspaper. Did you notice that next week or this week perhaps Two young boys are to be executed for murder. And uh, that the mother of uh, the boy who was murdered said she wrote this criminal, but she couldn't forgive him. She could feel sorry for him, but she couldn't forgive him. And do you not see how difficult her position is? having lost an 18, 19-year-old boy through this vicious murder, how difficult it would be for her to forgive him. And yet do you not see that unless she can, she cannot rightly call herself a child of God? Unless she can say, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Thy sins be forgiven thee. I don't even want that you pay this penalty. The law may demand it, but not I. Don't you see that unless she can purge herself that way, she has not yet attained her spiritual identity? And do you not see that I'm not judging her because I know how difficult it would be if we were faced with that situation? And no one is in a position to say, positively, I could rise to that high consciousness. Therefore, there must be compassion for those boys and there must be compassion for that woman equally. Because until we can say to all those who despitefully use us, persecute us, tyrannize over us, unless we can say, neither do I condemn thee, thy sins be forgiven thee, I wish no punishment unto you, rather that God open your eyes and set you free. Until then, we have not attained our Christhood, not in its full measure. And what we are doing is struggling toward that point where we could look out and not only say to the impersonal criminal who has done nothing to us, Father, forgive you, but where we could look at the criminal who has done it unto us and still say, no eye for an eye, no tooth for a tooth, no punishment do I seek for you. We had an example of this a few years ago in California where a youngster of about 15 took his father's automobile out of the garage without permission and without having a license to drive and raced it through the streets and killed a young boy. And the boy who did it was apprehended, of course. 
arrested and tried. And you know what the parents of the killed boy did? They went to the court and asked the judge to parole that boy in their custody so they could adopt him as their son and bring him up in the right way. And the judge did it. And that boy is an adopted son in the household of the parents whose son he killed. I don't know whether we could rise to that degree of Christhood, but they did. And then you only know whether you have the right to call yourself the full Christ if you know in your heart you could do that. So it is then. Let us acknowledge this. It is true. Christ is my life, my mind, my soul, my being. Christhood is my true name and nature. And my effort in this plane of life is to so live as to rise to the actual demonstration of my sonship. And if year by year I can so live as to show forth a little more and more and more of that Christhood, there is hope that one day we will attain. Now, this brings us to another of our New Testament teachings. Have that mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the truth is, you have it. And those whom he addressed had it. But again, he was recognizing you haven't attained it. You haven't achieved it. You're not living it. Therefore, I say to you now, have that mind in you. Be the Christ. And so again, you'll find that the mission of Christ Jesus is first to reveal to us that there is such a mind such a transcendental consciousness. Secondly, how we may attain it. And so you have again the function and the message and the mission of the infinite way. It reveals that there is a superconsciousness that we may attain. It is a revelation that there is a divine state of consciousness which is called Christ consciousness, spiritual consciousness, divine consciousness, absolute consciousness, fourth dimensional consciousness. But the infinite way acknowledges with the master that as humans we don't have access to it, but that we must so live as to attain oneness with it. And the infinite way then goes on to say, since there is a you who is a human being, since there is a divine consciousness, the infinite way has as its function showing you, teaching you how to become consciously one with it and demonstrate the 15th chapter of John. Sometimes students ask me if I'm not afraid that our students are going to get weary hearing me talk about the 15th chapter of John. Those who do may withdraw because as long as I live on this plane of existence, I will be drawing attention to the 15th chapter of John in which it is revealed that unless you are living consciously one with your vine, with your source, unless you are abiding in the word and letting the word abide in you, you are as a branch of a tree that is cut off. You are the creature Paul spoke of. 
who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. But that when you unite yourself again consciously with the vine, with your Christhood, with your spiritual identity, when you consciously abide in the word and let the word abide in you, then you bear fruit richly because now you have that mind that was in Christ Jesus. You are at one with it and you draw on it and it becomes the meat, wine, and water of your life. It becomes the staff of life, the bread. It becomes the power of resurrection unto you. But ye must be born again. Ye must renew your conscious oneness with God. And this is something that the infinite way has revealed. No experience can come to you except through your consciousness. Therefore, no one can reunite you to Christ. No religious service or ceremony or ritual or rite can put you in communion with God or can baptize you. The only way that you can be baptized in his spirit, the only way that you can have communion is through your consciousness. In other words, you must consciously commune with God to have communion with God. You must consciously baptize yourself in his spirit. You must consciously realize I live and move and have my being in him and he dwelleth in me. This has to take place up here in your consciousness by a conscious act of thought. That is why the master said the way is straight and narrow and few that be that attain it because there are only a few willing to think. There are only a few willing to know the truth. Those few attain, but they must make a conscious effort of consciousness, a conscious effort of mind, a conscious effort of thought, and they must do it not once. Pray without ceasing. You will notice that if you were to obey the or heed the instructions in the message of the infinite way, that you would awaken in the morning and not get out of bed, but lie there a few minutes to consciously dwell in God and let God consciously dwell in you. A conscious act of your mind must take place in order for you to declare, this is the day the Lord hath made and God governs this day, therefore God governs me. God governs all there is in this day, therefore God governs my acts, my thoughts, my deeds. God governs my being and my body. Then you can get out of bed. You have made conscious contact with God. You have brought God consciously into your life. And you have brought yourself consciously into the life of God. When you go to the breakfast table, if you eat without pausing for a second, you're leaving God out of your food. You're leaving God out of your digestion. You're leaving God out of the substance of your being. You have to pause before you eat, even breakfast, even tea. And realize, but for the grace of God, there'd be no food on earth. It is the grace of God that has given us crops in the ground, fruits on the tree, flowers in the garden, cattle on a thousand hills, fish in the sea, birds in the air. But for the grace of God, there would be no table set 
anywhere. When you've done that, you have made God the source of your supply. Your supply must be infinite now. You've made God the source of it, rather than just how much you had in your pocketbook or in your earning capacity. When you leave your home, whether it's for shopping or marketing or to go to business, if you walk out of your door without pausing, you're walking out of, into a world of men and women, a world of bad drivers, a world of sin, a world of accident. But if you pause and realize his presence goes before me, his presence makes the crooked places straight. His grace is my sufficiency up and down the walks and in and out of the cars and up and down the road. His presence goes before me to prepare mansions of joy and peace and harmony. You have entered the life of God and you've brought the life of God into your experience as you leave your home. If you go into business and leave God outside, you've done it. But if you go into your business realizing he performeth that which is given me to do, he perfecteth my business, his presence goes with me on every mission, you have brought God into your life of business and you've brought your business into the life of God. It'll be eternal and fruitful and successful. If you retire at night and leave God outside, you've just got a human night's sleep and it may be a sleepful one, a wakeful one. But when you retire and realize, I'm resting in God, I'm abiding in God. My rest is a spiritual rest, not just a dead physical unconsciousness, but my rest is spiritual because God gives me my rest. And God is spirit, therefore my rest is spiritual. God's grace governs me when I'm sleeping or when awaking. And God's grace awakens me in the morning to his light, to his brightness, to his wisdom, to his government. Do you not see that this is praying without ceasing and this is being one with your vine? This is living consciously attached to the stream of life the infinite stream of life that bubbles up into life eternal. This is living consciously one with your source. This is living with God as your substance, your activity, your law. And do you not see that no one can do this for you? Only that which you do with your active consciousness becomes your active life. If you leave God outside and take all that for granted, so will it be unto you. If you make God a living part of your life, your being, your body, your business, your art, your talent, there's no possibility of separation. Because there is only one reason why we have a human world that has in it sin, disease, and death. It isn't that God has left us. It is that we have left God. Now, we can't leave God physically because the kingdom of God is within us. It means we have only locked him out of our consciousness. And we've done that because we were brought up that way. We weren't told from birth that we have to make God consciously a part of our being. We were erroneously taught that if we went to Sunday school for an hour on Sunday, that was all right. If we went to church for an hour on Sunday, 
that was all right. It never was true. Whether you go to church or don't go to church has nothing to do with God. What has to do with God is what is taking place in your consciousness because the kingdom of God isn't in a holy mountain or a holy temple. The kingdom of God isn't here or there. The kingdom of God is within you. But is it if you're not aware of it? Of course not. It's there, but of no avail. Therefore, only what we live in our consciousness becomes our conscious life. Only what we can embody, embrace within our consciousness can we demonstrate externally. That which we spiritually realize, we externally demonstrate. The kingdom of God within becomes the realm of peace and harmony and joy without. Therefore, what we entertain in consciousness is what we demonstrate in life, no more, no less. That is why the Master gave us this. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And if you sow five minutes of God a day, you'll reap five minutes of God. And if you reap praying without ceasing, if you sow praying without ceasing, you'll reap praying without ceasing. If you sow God five minutes a day, you'll reap God five minutes a day. It is the sowing that you do that depends, that brings about the reaping. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. Now, theologically, that has been misinterpreted and mistaught so that people believe that sowing to the flesh means that if you commit physical sin, has any such meaning at all. It means actually if you put power out here in effect that's just what you're going to sow some good and some bad. If you sow to the spirit which means if you consciously realize that spirit is your life spirit is your law spirit is your government that's what you want to sow. Spiritual harmony. If you put your faith, hope, confidence, and reliance in the spiritual source of life, you will sow harmony. If you, you will reap harmony. If you sow to the flesh, if you sow to the fact that a bank account supports me, a business supports me, or my heart determines my health or my life. That's what you're going to reap. But the minute you make the transition in your consciousness to my heart isn't my life, God is my life. My body doesn't determine my life. God determines my life. A calendar doesn't determine how long I shall live on earth. God determines how long I shall live on earth. Now we are sowing to the spirit. The longer we persist in believing that weather and climate and food and outer circumstances determine our harmony, the longer we'll know discord and inharmony. But the very moment we begin to know spirit is the source of my being. Spirit is the law of my being. Spirit is the cause of my being. Spirit is my all and only. In that degree, we are making spirit the governing influence of our existence. And now we can look forward to sowing spiritually, a reaping spiritually. We sow to the spirit and we reap spiritually or else we sow to the belief that our good is dependent on something external, and that's what we reap. So let this be clear to us. Whatever degree of truth you know, this is the degree of truth 
that you will demonstrate, no more, no less. You determine the degree of harmony that's to come into your life. No one can do this for you. You could have the whole of Christ placed before you if you don't recognize it, if you don't accept it, it's meaningless to you. It could be right in your community and you wouldn't know it. It could be right in your household and you wouldn't know it. It is you with your consciousness. You have to be open. You have to do the sowing consciously and the reaping comes of its own accord. So remember this. To us as human comes the teaching of the Christ and its function is that we die to the human and be reborn again of the spirit. That we consciously renounce and reject materiality and mortality as the basis of our being and consciously accept Christ, consciously become aware. I might call your attention to this, that about a year ago, the Church of England changed its rules on baptism. And it said to its followers, that you do not have to baptize your child anymore. May if you like, but it doesn't encourage it anymore. Wait until it is of an age of decision and let it make its own decision. Do you see why? You can't baptize anyone into Christ. It must be an act of their own will, an act of their own consciousness. You can't make a babe accept Christ. Only you can accept Christ for yourself. And you can't do it asleep or drunk. You have to do it awake and consciously. You have to consciously know what you are doing when you accept Christ. Then you are baptized in him. And the church is recognizing that now. That an act of baptism should be an act of will and judgment of the individual who is adult enough to consciously say, I do not wish to sow to matter anymore, to materiality, but to Christ. We are going to have a period of rest for about five minutes. 